Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is Episode 6, Artificial Intelligence. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen. How are you doing today, Sam? Uh, Doing okay, all things considered. Okay, I think it looks like I caught you off guard with that comment there. Yeah, you never see it coming. (laughs) So today we're going to be talking about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, which seems to be invading every aspect of our lives. In fact, we had to unplug our piece of artificial technology so that we didn't get bothered by anyone showing up today. Um, So let's just start off by talking about what is artificial intelligence. In your own words, define what artificial intelligence is to you. Uh, I guess if I had to put it in my own words, it's probably humanity's ability to create programs that can think for themselves on, well, maybe not think for themselves because I don't mean entirely uh, like what's the word self-aware um but programs that can function on their own whether that be completing a task over and over again or something more advanced like memory you know storing memory things like that okay and i think that's that's certainly a valid uh definition um i think there's several definitions Mm -hmm. really and we'll, we'll talk about those but the clinical definition from the research that i did Uh, is that artificial intelligence is the simulation of human intelligence in machines. Um, And it used to be confined to science fiction, but in recent decades, it's broken into the real world. Uh, It's becoming one of the most important technologies in our time. And really, it's in everything. So in addition to being uh, the brains behind facial recognition, AI is helping to solve critical problems in transportation, retail, healthcare. Uh, It's spotting breast cancer uh, missed by human eyes. Um, On the internet, it's used for everything from speech recognition to spam filtering. Uh, Movie studios even start to plan uh, plan to start using AI to analyze potential movies to choose which ones to put into development. Uh, So it's really, depending on your aspect of it, it's really a matter of replacing human thinking, it seems like, in, in many cases. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about there's four basic classifications of artificial intelligence, uh, two of which that have already been realized with current technology, two of which have not and potentially could go in different directions. Uh, then we'll look at the pros and cons of today's artificial intelligence. Um, and we'll look at intelligence in the future, which is, you know, one of the things that we always do. And we'll look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of where artificial intelligence could go. Because there's some some very well-known critics of artificial intelligence um, who are its detractors. Uh, so let's get started. We'll talk about our four types of artificial intelligence first. So um, the first type of artificial intelligence that we're going to look at are reactive machines. So these are the most basic types of AI systems, um, and they are purely reactive. Uh, They don't have the ability to form memories. They don't have the ability to recognize past experiences. Um, And probably the biggest uh, example of this is uh, IBM's Deep Blue. Have you, have you, are you familiar with Deep Blue? No, um, I, I believe in the notes. Is that the one, the chess machine? That's correct. Okay. Um, yeah. No, I'm not. I mean, I've heard of different programs, uh, you know, 
going up against chess players, but not that one specifically. So, so Deep Blue was a whole computer system that IBM had built um, with the sole purpose. It was a, a supercomputer with the sole purpose of playing chess better than humans. Um, I don't know if you've ever, have you ever played computer chess on the PC or anything? No, I had a chess board that played against you. Like it told you where to move the pieces. Right. But I'm so bad at chess. It didn't really need to try that hard. So. Well, and, and that like, I guess that's my point. I'm in, I'm the <laughs> same way. Like I know how the pieces move yeah. and I know some basic strategy, but I'm terrible at it. Mm -hmm. Um, so it didn't take much for <laughs> a basic computer yeah. game to beat me at chess. Um, so IBM built this entire supercomputer to play who was at the time the world champion Gary Kasparov um, back in the in the late 90s um, and it was simplistic in its ability but it was sophisticated in its achievement so deep blue um, could identify the pieces on the chessboard and know how each moves okay so he's reached my level of intelligence at that point so I can identify them and move them um, Deep Blue can make predictions about what moves might be next for it and its opponents. And this is where really its intelligence could go. So, for instance, it could analyze the board and it could compute every possible permutation of a move that could be done at that time, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. And then it could decide what the best move is and basically play an entire game out on a single move. Um it can choose the most optimal moves, uh, but it doesn't have the concept of the past. Like it can't learn from its mistakes. Uh, it doesn't have any memory of what happened before. So it's here now in the moment. Um, and, and that's really where its restrictions were. It could analyze the current situation. Um, whereas Another example would be Google's AlphaGo, where it played another strategy game called Go, which is a Chinese game. Um, and Go is the Chinese equivalent of chess, but it's a territorial-based game. So there's a lot of strategy. There's a lot of forethought that goes into it. Um, there's sacrifice strategies and so forth that go into Go. Um, and it's beaten the top Go players in the world, but it can't evaluate all the potential moves that Deep Blue can. So it's different types of technology. Um, its analysis method was more sophisticated because it used neural networks, which is exactly what humans have for brains, where it, we can form connections in our brains through a neural network. Um, but it doesn't have the ability to retain or learn or anything like that. So that's sort of the limitation that we have with reactive machines. And, and they're still in use today. But this was sort of the infancy of artificial intelligence. Um, the, are there any applications that you could think of from a practical standpoint that we could use a machine like that today? Uh, maybe not practical, but I guess for competitive play. Um, if, you know, because I know IBM also made Watson for Jeopardy. Right. Um, and that did pretty well. I don't remember who won against Ken Jennings and the third player, but I know it did very well uh, with that kind of technology. And I imagine it's probably, you know, something similar where they analyze, because Jeopardy repeats questions. So they probably analyzed all the questions, put it into its memory banks or its data banks, and then allowed it to get strategies from that. Um, so I could definitely see for competitive play like that. Um, and also, it could probably be used to analyze. Um, trends in these games um, so like how the best in the world the best humans in the world how they win and then maybe learn from that information um, but I I might just be blanking but I can't think of any any more practical than that and I think that's sort of the challenge that that artificial intelligence had in those early days was that you couldn't make money off of it. Yeah. Like there wasn't something where you could build this machine, stick it in industry and have it produce something. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was confined to college studies. Um, the next type of machine type two class are machines with limited memory. So they can look into the past. And for this, we look at self-driving cars. So self-driving cars, for example, can observe other cars' speed and direction um, uh, that can't be done in just one moment, so they have to look at it in time slices. 
Um, they need to be able to identify specific objects. They need to monitor them over time. Uh, you think of just driving down the road, you're looking at objects. Even if you're just looking at the lines in the road and the bends in the road, you have to look at these over time and, and there has to be a progression sequence that the computer itself can understand and then predict what it has to do. Um, the observations are, are added to the self-driving car's pre-programmed representations of the world. So you figure you have a map overlay, then you have these observations that are overlaid on the map itself so you can do obstacle avoidance and things along those lines. Um, these include lane markings, traffic lights, and other important elements like curves in the road. Uh, so now at the type two stage, now you're getting something that's a little bit more uh, practical at this point. You have something you can sell. Tesla loves this technology for their cars, their autopilot system that they have. Um, where do you see other applications of these limited memory type two AIs of functioning? I think definitely the, the self-driving cars are the beginning of it, but I could see that technology being migrated to other things, maybe for military use, maybe, uh, or um, I think we have it coming up later, but uh, shipping, or not shipping, uh, like trucking, like big-scale trucking, um, where these the trucks are automated, they're sent. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Logan, uh, there's automated trucks in that movie, which are they're kind of terrifying because they don't yeah. stop. But um, I could definitely see that being used for commerce, maybe, or for trade. Um, a way to automate these ships or these trucks to move across long distances. Um, of course, that would eliminate those jobs, but that's a different discussion. Yeah, well, and even if you look at it from a, a, a direct practical standpoint, that last mile delivery, you've got companies like Amazon that are looking to do automated drone deliveries. You know, you don't have a guy sitting in a truck with a remote control. You know, these drones are being attached to packages and they know based on an overhead topographical map where the addresses are so the artificial intelligence there is flying them in dropping them off making sure they don't crash in anyone or decapitate anyone yeah i think they tried that but people like smashed up the drones so they had uh, to stop they did have some issues with interactions with people there where they tend to uh to scare people and you're not even getting to the uncanny va uh, valley perspective there. It's just people don't like drones flying around their houses. Uh, so yeah, that's that, you know, the, this control, this automation, like if you could have an entire fleet of tankers and those tankers are com computer controlled, you could eliminate human error. Right. Like in the example of the Exxon Valdez, where you can avoid a lot of the accidents that you run into because the computers are, can react much faster. The next form that they talk about is where we haven't gotten to yet. And this is where we sort of get to that scary aspect of things. And that's what they call theory of mind. So machines in the next more advanced class not only form representations about the world, but also about other gadgets and entities in the world. Uh, in psychology, it's called theory of mind, the understanding that people creatures and objects in the world can have thoughts and emotions that affect their own behavior without understanding each other's motives and intentions and without taking into account what somebody else knows uh, either more about me or the environment working together is at best difficult so from a theory of mind standpoint we're talking about direct interaction with with robots in this case and the example that I could think of here is a manufacturing situation. You're building cars. Uh, we've got robots in, in uh, auto plants now, but those robots are single purpose robots, right? So they pick something up and they flip it and they put it down and that's all they do. Well, this next level here is more like if we think of Iron Man and how Iron Man, when he's building his suit, He's interacting oh, yeah. with the robots around him. And when the robot does something wrong, he yells at the robot. And the robot exhibits some sadness as a result. So you're talking about the first level of really intelligent machines here. Where the machines can interact with you. And you kind of get this with your personal assistants now. Your Amazons, your Googles. Uh, I 
even say Siri, but Siri is literally the absolute worst personal assistant out there. Um, but they are able to react to you. They're able to know environmentally, depending on what aspects of technology you have in your, in your home. Um, Amazon knows that I walk in the door. I unlock my door. I turn my lights on. It knows I'm here. It can, that can trigger a reaction of telling me what the weather is or starting dinner or turning my air conditioner on or something like that. Um, so you're getting to the point where they're sensing the environment, they're interacting with you as an individual, and then they're doing something. Um, where do you think something like that would go and, and what would be a marketable use for that? Well, I think it basically turns they're like personal servants right at that point um they just aren't aware that they are <laughs> right because um, their only purpose I, it's kind of it became like a joke but there's a part in um i don't know if you ever watch rick and morty but there's a part where uh the scientist guy creates a robot that is only made to give him butter for his toast and the robot goes what is my purpose and he goes you pass me butter and he goes dear god <laughs> um because he realizes that that's his only purpose in life so you know there, it's it's that step before self-awareness which is the next right. step we'll talk about but it's that purely subservient purely util utility function right and i think like you said a great example is all the personal assistants that we have and i'm not sure how much of them are recognizing you but maybe just recognizing inputs through voice commands yeah it's like you have to yes. say you know so and so turn on the lights it doesn't like or i could be wrong but it doesn't like see your face through a camera recognize you and then no, but things. for instance, um, your Amazon devices can recognize your voice. Yeah, yeah, so well, Google does too, yeah. When I say, hey, email so-and-so, they don't say, well, who's emailing from? Yeah. If somebody else comes in, if, if it recognizes Michelle's voice and Michelle says, hey, email Joe, the email comes from Michelle, so it knows. So there is some very basic um, cognizance of who it's interacting with at that point. Yeah. Um, but... Um, yeah, um, I, I agree with you 100% there that, that it's a limited version, but it's definitely there. Yeah, and I, I could definitely see that being improved upon, well, I guess it depends on how you look at it, but upgraded to be more intuitive where maybe they do have some kind of a little bit more um, autonomy, you know, with how they can function and how they can control different appliances and things like that in the future. And I go back to Tony Stark and Jarvis. Yeah. yeah. You know, that type of thing is, is sort of the direction that they're going with these personal assistants here. Um, and then the fourth and final one they talk about is probably the most controversial, I'd say, and that's self-awareness. Um, the final step of AI development is to build systems that can form representations about themselves. Consciousness is also called self-awareness for a reason. I want that item is a very different statement than I know I want that item. Uh, conscious beings are aware of themselves, know about their internal states, and are able to predict feelings of others. Uh, we assume someone honking behind us uh, in traffic is angry or impatient because that's how we would feel when we honk at others. Uh, without theory of mind which is the natural progression to this, we couldn't make those sorts of inferences. So where does self-awareness take us? Let me ask you that. I mean, I personally think that that's where things are, they get a little bit more scary because then it becomes what is, I mean, the obvious answer is the difference between us and a self-aware AI or we have blood and bones and things like that. But on a thought level, if we function the same way, you know, our brains are essentially really, really complex computers, right? So if we're able to create an AI that can function like that and can think and can store memories and anticipate emotion and on some level empathize even, you know, if it can recognize the person behind me honking is angry, they're able to put themselves in that person's shoes. And I think that shows a higher level of intelligence that's equal to humans. It's certainly above animals, I think. <laughs> so so let me expound on that example real quick. So when someone's honking behind you, do you feel empathy towards them? No, I just figure I did something wrong probably. <laughs> that's how I see it. I don't get mad at them. And that's one way to do it. Now, when I get someone honking behind me, it annoys me. Yeah. So do I really want this artificial intelligence controlling a 2,000-pound projectile <laughs> To get angry because somebody's yeah. honking at it. Well, that's the thing, right? It's like if we're trying to replicate, or maybe we're not intentionally doing this, but if we're trying to duplicate the human thought process, 
humans are not clearly not perfect beings. No. Right. And we're prone to our baser desires. The, um, so I think that is something that could be, you know, recognized too. And, and especially if AI doesn't have that, what humans have like a conscious telling you, you know, a sense of morals, a sense of what is right and wrong, the threat of the consequences of your actions, you know, it might, it might not have anything to stop it from, you know, a, um, acting on those impulses right away. You know, it's, it's funny. You, you mentioned that, um, I can't help but think of, uh, you know, Roman mythology. You know, we we as humans think that we're made in God's image. And, and when you look at, at Roman mythology, you had these gods that were cruel. Uh, they were sadistic at times. They were compassionate at times. But they were power incarnate. And everything that bad happened because they were angry or we did something wrong. And we were really reflecting our own nature on them to try to explain things. Yeah, and even if you think about it, it's it's almost like emotion-based, right? You have the god of war. Right. Who is uh, Mars, right? And then that he's typically portrayed as, you know, angry and primal. And, and then you have, you know, goddesses of love who are lustful and things like that. And you have, like, Zeus, well, not Zeus, Jupiter, who is very prideful so it's it's almost yeah like you said a direct reflection of each of these emotions being represented right yeah. and and the scary thing the, that you know we created the gods you know from our own needs and we're creating the AIs yeah so there's a very good chance that we're going to have these AIs reflect the same flaws that we do and the same virtues that we do hopefully but it's the flaws that scare me yeah you know if I if if I program my AI to react emotionally to somebody honking its horn and that reaction is the same one that I have, I have enough self-restraint yeah. to know that I can't pull my car over and go beat this guy up. Whereas the car might get angry and cut him off, yeah. you know? That's where it gets kind of scary there when you're self-aware. Yeah. And then if the <laughs> – this is a hypothetical, but like if the AI has access to information on that person, they look up their license plate number, they find their address, you know, yeah, who knows? Yeah, you know, the old, the old car movie <laughs> Christine, you know, yeah. it's, it's going to try and get you, you know? <laughs> so I wanted to – before we moved on with the pros and cons and everything, I thought it was worthwhile to kind of lay out the groundwork on what, what we're talking about with artificial intelligence. Uh, so let's take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll look at the pros and cons of today's artificial intelligence. For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Starforge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, Guild Lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So let's talk about the pros and cons of artificial intelligence. Um, being ever the optimist that I am, not. Let's look at the pros first. So the first one that I have here, and feel free to throw out your own or, or dispute the ones that I have, um, reduction in human error. Um, one example here is artificial intelligence and in weather forecasting has significantly increased the reliability of weather forecasts. So instead of being, I don't know, 3% correct, they're 5% correct now. <laughs> um, do you think reduction in human error is a benefit of... AI? Yeah, definitely. But I, I don't know. Sometimes human error can be a good thing. You know, sometimes new ideas are born out of that or, or you know. So there, there are two sides to it. But definitely human error when it comes to things like, I, I don't know, air traffic control maybe, where there's lives at stake. You know, I think those are definitely 
areas where human error, if it could be reduced to zero, would be ideal. Sure, yeah. And, and air traffic control is a great example because that's a very high stress. Yeah. It takes a great toll on air traffic yeah, controllers. Yeah, that, that was something else I was going to bring up too, which is kind of with this, is the human cost of doing a lot of jobs where if your people are overworked or underpaid, replacing them with an AI who wouldn't care <laughs> or you wouldn't have to worry about their uh, civil liberties as much, I guess, could be you know a better replacement than abusing a workforce. Sure, sure. Well, and that even translates into my next point here is the reduced risk to humans. Yeah. Um, the example here is uh, AI robots could be used to clean up nuclear and chemical waste in Chernobyl and Fukushima, uh, where you don't have to expose humans to that sort of thing. Um, they're also available 24-7. So, again, we look at, at workers' rights here, and we're assuming we're not applying them to AI entities. So you can make your machines work 24-7. Until they gain self-awareness. I was going to say, that's how you get a robot uprising. Right, until they gain self-awareness and unionize. <laughs> uh, digital assistance. So AI-powered customer service uh, centers can provide fast, efficient service on a consistent basis. Have you ever experienced an yeah. AI customer service center? Well, especially now with the coronavirus, most people, most call centers are not fully staffed. I had to call, I think I ordered food from somewhere the other day. And I had to call, and I went through like three different robots. None of them helped me. So maybe this is a pro in the future, but it's, I don't think it's a pro right now. Okay. So so, <laughs> and I and I would agree that you know I called. I think I had to call the cable company yeah. for work to get uh, a problem taken care of. And what took me fifteen minutes to get to a person, I I probably would have had the problem solved in mm -hmm. that time. Yep. Um, Okay, so I'll, I'll buy that. Uh, how about decision making? AI are capable of analyzing input from a wide variety of sensors and making quick, decisive choices that can mean life and death in things such as manufacturing um, and driving cars. Do you think that's a benefit? Uh, yeah, I think it can be, um, unless you end up with something like the train dilemma where you have to put one life ab above, like, 20. And I think the AI would obviously choose the one life. But I don't know how well that would sell to, uh, you know, whoever's right. behind the... Well, the other 20 wouldn't like yeah. that, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. Um, or I, yeah, you know what I meant. I meant save the 20, sacrifice right. the one. But I don't know how well that would go over in the press or things like that, you know. Because there was a, a while, a long time ago, there was that self-driving car that crashed and killed somebody, right? Yeah. And people were like lost their minds over it. And that was one. And I think it was an accident. I think it was on the fault of the person that got hit. I could be wrong, but I think that they were crossing when they weren't supposed to or something. But still, people, I think, already are so wary of this kind of technology. You know, and I think the second that any of those decisions, if they make, you know, a thousand right ones, but one wrong one, right. you know, I think the public out, the backlash would be bad. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. There was a news article last week, and it was somewhere, I don't remember exactly where, but it was pretty sure it was Eastern Europe where this guy was driving in his Tesla Model 3 down the highway doing 60, 70 miles an hour, had autopilot turned on, was in the passing lane, and there was a panel van that had flipped over and was in his lane. And he, the artificial intelligence saw it, but because it was in an environment where it was traveling at such a speed, it sensors didn't pick up the obstacle because the obstacle was stationary and he's moving so fast. It didn't pick up the obstacle fast enough to break in time. It tried to break, but it, it wasn't trying to avoid it. It was trying to break the stop and slammed right into this truck. Um, so, and that's because there wasn't supposed to be an obstacle. So yeah. its ability to predict an unexpected thing like that was compromised by the fact that its sensors didn't reach out far enough to know that it was there. The guy saw it. The guy knew it was there. And you could actually see the smoke from the tires as it tried to brake, but it still slammed right so into it. That's so scary. Me. There's no, like, manual override for that? <laughs> um, like, if you hit the brake in a Tesla, does it just not work? I think it's one of these things where the guy thought oh. he had enough faith in the system. No way. I would never. And, and I would never let a self-driving <laughs> yeah. car self-drive me either. Oh, yeah, no. You know, I, I don't... The safest hands are still so. our own. <laughs> uh, so how about enhanced human functions? Advanced AI is capable capable of detecting breast cancer, which we mentioned earlier. 
Uh, it can detect them at earlier stages than humans. So do you think something like that where they're acting as an extra set of eyes is a helpful thing for us? Yeah, I think that's, a, that's all fine to me, using it as a tool, a way to enhance our own uh, abilities, right? And even with um, artificial limbs, too, all that stuff replacing people's arms and legs or whatever they may have lost. Right. Um, 3D printing, organs, that stuff. Excuse me. Um, I think that's all wonderful. So let me flip that particular one around. And using that same technology, <laughs> artificial intelligence is being employed in facial recognition. So there's a, a robbery at the local convenience store, let's say, theoretically. And there are cameras everywhere. You know, I have cameras around the house. You have cameras on just about every street corner. And the police come down and they decide that they want to do an area warrant where they collect all the camera footage. They go to the cell phone companies. They collect all the cell phone data of people's uh, phones that were in the area and so forth. And then they throw all that information at an AI. And the AI, through facial recognition, cell phone records, and, and everything else comes up with a list of 30 suspects that were in the area when the crime occurred. And you happen to be one of those 30. How would that make you feel? I mean, that that's where you get to like Orwellian levels of and of problems, you yeah. know. And it was it's actually a real issue or you know, it's becoming an issue here now too, but in Hong Kong during the the protest there, people had to cover their faces because there's cameras everywhere. Same thing in London, too, because yep. um, the CCTV problem is really, really bad there. And, oh, they're everywhere there. Yeah, and they straight up admit that we are using this to fine you if we need to. So when it's maybe not a violent crime like a burglary, but maybe it's just a protest and these people need to be, you know, are being rounded up by the government and silence, that is terrifying. <laughs> yeah. And and facial recognition especially because, you know, everything is, all your devices are constantly listening and watching. Um that is terrifying. <laughs> yeah. So that's the scary aspect where it can be twisted. So that leads us into our cons. <laughs> yeah. what, what, what is bad about um, AI? And the first one that I have here is it costs a lot. It's, it's the cost of creation. You know, increasingly sophisticated AI requires constant improvements in hardware and software. Um, fortunately, we have computers that are forever increasing in their capacity, but the costs are. Uh, so you look at the artificial intelligence in your phone. Ten years ago, a, a top-of-the-line phone cost you about 500, 600 bucks. Nowadays, you're looking at over a thousand bucks. Is artificial intelligence worth that cost? Um, for me personally, I'm not, I'm not sure because I don't use my voice assistant or anything like that, those aspects of artificial intelligence, I don't really use it that much. But the way it tracks weather and things like that, or emergency alerts, that's all very helpful. I'm not sure how much of that $1,000 for the phone is going, is because of AI. I think it's just more how the the processing, like, like the computing of phones nowadays and the cameras that are in them, I think that's what drives the cost up more. And the how supplies are gotten to make the phones um and how those deals are negotiated um but yeah i think ai should be worth or you know i'm okay with it being that much okay then let's look at unemployment so the dystopian fear that everybody has when you inject machines into the workforce mm -hmm. is they're going to replace human jobs and and we've seen this happen in the auto industry and other manufacturing industries just with dumb robotic machines do you think the threat to unemployment is something that's real for AI? Yeah, definitely. Unfortunately, I think it's inevitable because, right, I mean, especially if robots end up being cheaper, safer, cheaper is going to be, be the higher thing for a, right. for a business. Um, so, But if it helps them minimize cost and they can also say that it maximizes safety because there's no people that are willing to get hurt. Um, I think it's it's just how things are going to go, unfortunately. Well, and a counter to that would be something like, um, let's say, landscaping. All right. So right now, the landscapers come to my house. They've got six guys that wheel out various machines and they cut my grass. Um, you could replace those with one intelligent lawnmower that can do all the work itself. Um, you don't have... 
a lot of people that are clamoring for landscaping jobs because they don't particularly pay very much. You know, they're really the bottom of the line minimum wage type jobs in the summer, mostly for high school kids and stuff like that. And a lot of people don't want those jobs. So if it's replacing jobs that people don't want, is that a good thing? I don't know if it's a good thing because people, I mean, high schoolers, a lot of high schoolers need those jobs, right? To make a little extra money on the side or to start um, saving up for college. But again, I, I think that if a company would be able to find a cheaper way to do their business that they're always going to go for that regardless of of what their you know employment issue would be and i would tend to agree with that one of the things that we looked at i work in a, in a manufacturing facility and some of what we do is very delicate creation of connector parts and stuff like that and it requires far more dexterity and skill than i have and certainly better vision than i have but a lot of that is something that could be done by a robot. So if you come into work and you're doing the same thing over and over every day, is that something that maybe we take five people off the line, we put one robot in there, and then we take one of those five people and we train them how to work the robot? Yeah, I could definitely see that. I mean, that's what surgeons have, right, where they have really complex... I don't know the specific because I'm, you know, I'm not a doctor, but... They have very complex machines that allow them to do more intricate work, but they have surgeons that specialize in these machines that are really, really good at, you know, I think they even use like video game controllers to move the parts and things like that. So I think there is like a mid, uh, uh, a middle point between full robot uh, employee kind of thing versus entirely human. I think there's somewhere in between where you can kind of merge the two. So let's go down that, that route there with the medical industry. So one of the other complaints about AI is it's, it's emotionless. And I think that really comes out more in the bedside manner mm -hmm. in an operating room like that, yeah. um, where the machines right now are there to assist doctors. They don't do the work. The doctors are doing the work. But I can certainly see a situation in the not-too-distant future where a robot is doing an operation, you know, uh, I don't know, torn uh, ACL, and it's doing, it's, it's, you know, not anything where it's doing life-impacting heart surgery or something like that, but like secondary surgeries. Um, you, you're not going to joke with the robot while it's yeah, doing it. Yeah. You know, it's not going to worry that it, it moved the wrong way and it hurt you. Uh, do you think that lack of emotion in AI is, is a concern when it comes to things like that? Definitely. I think that's one of the biggest obstacles when dealing with AI, just in general, not just even in the medical field. But I think that's one of people's biggest hangups is that it's humans are really good at recognizing other humans and other humans that are being genuine. And any attempt to fake that, you can you can detect it right away. Sure. And I think that that's one of the issues because we don't, if we don't have that connection, especially when someone is, you know, sticking a, a scalpel in us or something, <laughs> I think there has to be that level of trust that, especially for something like that, that you need. Yeah. And even if, even if there was a doctor on the other side of the operating, uh, you know, on the other side of the glass or whatever, directing or being like, hey, it's fine, there's still a robot there, you know? And I think that people would, would have an issue with that. Um, but it's probably still going to go that way. And people will just, like I said, maybe find that midway point or just learn to <laughs> be okay with it, just I guess. Just learn to deal with yeah. it. Um, static thinking. You know, today's AI lacks the ability to think outside the box. It can't conceive of the world around it. Um, and basically it's confined to a very specific program. Um, do you think that inability, let's, let's think cars, you know, driving cars right now. So... They detect something in the road. You know, you've got a car full of passengers. You've got four people in your car. Their sensors tell you that there's something in the road. And you have cars on, on lanes on either side of you. you. You can't stop in time. The fact that this car knows that there's something there and is willing to slam on the brakes to avoid it even if that one, even if that thing happens to be, you know, a plastic bag that's blown across the street, um, it could put the, the passengers in danger there. Do you think that ability to, to not analyze objectively the surroundings is a detriment to AI today? 
Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think that's why you need some kind of human oversight to go with all of it, right? Until they can get to that level where they can store those memories and process it and come up with a more, I guess, human way of looking at things. Um, I think having the human oversight or having the ability for the for the human to override um, that is is almost essential. I would agree. Yeah, hundred percent. And the last one that we talk about in the cons here is AIs don't improve over time um, naturally. So <clears throat> go back to driving cars. Okay. So you commute an hour each way to work every day. You as a driver are constantly learning. You're learning how to drive in different weather, different lighting conditions with different vehicles around you. The more you drive, the better the driver you become because of the experience of driving, being a pilot the same way. To a car that's being driven by the AI, it's the same thing every day. It doesn't learn anything new. It doesn't improve its ability. It doesn't store any useful experience from that. Do you think that inability for AIs to learn today is a detriment of what we expect of them? Yeah, and I think that that's probably the next step, right? And that's that's another uh, stepping stone to self-awareness in general because once you start learning or once you start remembering, that's how you start learning from things, right? So I think once they're able to do that, then it's only a matter of time before they're at least more self-aware than they would be functioning as they are now. Sure, yeah. And, and hopefully, you know, we'll get there and it, it won't be at too high a cost. <laughs> Um, so that was all we had for that. I think we're going to come back. We're going to take a look at what artificial intelligence looks like in the future. Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. We'll look at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. So the future of artificial intelligence. Um... Again, this is sort of a, a pros and cons things, but I, I kind of broke it down into the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, that's just because I'm so positive on my outlook for AI. So the good that I wanted to talk about, one great example of this is fleets of self-driving cars. Uh, they can replace unsafe drivers. Uh, coming from New Jersey, we know there's a lot of unsafe drivers in our state. Um and they can replace human error on the roads. Um, how do you feel about the prospect of, of that? You mentioned uh, Logan and yeah. the self-driving trucks. And, you know, I remember the scene where they got cut off. Uh, so that doesn't clearly solve all the safety issues. What are your thoughts on that? No, I think uh, definitely. I think that, I don't know, I think it's a double-edged sword, right? Because you don't want to eliminate all, the, eliminate all those jobs because they're sort of the... I don't know, they always say truckers are like the backbone of the economy, right? Because once those stop moving, then commerce stops flowing across the country. Right. But I also think that the human error is a big part of that as well. And I think if you can eliminate that, then that's that's good, too. Um, I, I, I guess maybe if there was a way to, I don't know, Tony Stark it where no one's actually in the cab, the truck driver's back at, you know, truck driver HQ controlling it, um, you know, with a joystick or something. Some way to do it that way so that there's still that human that human touch so that you don't have a Logan situation where they're just going and not stopping. And cause that that's putting lives at risk too. So it's sure. like you're trading, you're trading one risk for another. That's a very good point. How about in our digital assistance? How about if we take our Alexa to the next level 
and we have the equivalent of Jarvis in our homes. Uh, do you think that that's really a direction that we're going to go and, and we should go? Uh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I don't. Because I think, especially because Alexas and your Googles are all controlled by multi-billion dollar corporations, and I think if those corporations were able to develop an AI on the level of Jarvis that they would absolutely use it for profit. They already are using Alexas and Googles for profit by constantly listening and giving you targeted advertisements and things like that. So I think the worst thing that could happen is for those things to get smarter, you know, because then they're only going to be able to exploit consumers even more and, and constantly monitor people. That's a very good point. How about with our public transportation systems? Do you think automating our trains and buses would be something that would be worthwhile? Um, I think it's a similar argument to the the trucking. Um, Those jobs are important, but you also do have uh, fatalities when when those workers are overworked or they're not under the right conditions to operate what they need to operate, but they still do because, you know, they have to. Right. Um, So, yeah, I think I would probably take a similar approach to the trucking where it's it's still human operated but maybe ai guided kind of or the other way around ai operated human guided um i think entirely having it be ai except for maybe like trains because they're on a track right so it's not like a bus where you have to navigate traffic but i think you know trains could probably work automated and, I, and you you make a very valid point there we had an incident in new jersey uh, a few yeah. years back where we had uh, a, a serious accident uh, up in North Jersey uh, that led to Amtrak, uh, New Jersey Transit rather, um, instituting what they call positive train control. So if if a train is detected as going out of control, the system itself can bring it to a safe stop and prevent accidents. So that's really the first phase of this automated public transportation. Um, so anytime you can bring a multi-thousand ton projectile like that safely to a stop I think is a good thing Uh, but buses I agree is you know in New Jersey buses have the right of way so buses have a tendency of not even looking to see if something's coming and they pull out Uh, I've seen several accidents with buses and several very near accidents with buses so me personally driving on the road with buses on a regular basis I think that we could benefit from some automation when it comes to that. Um, medical monitoring and proactive prevention of illnesses. Uh, so, for instance, there's a sensor that I wear that allows me to check my blood sugar with my phone. So I can very easily scan that. Um, I could totally see AI going to the point of, instead of me having to directly interact with it to scan, telling me when my blood sugar is too high and that I have to take medicine or if it's too low and I have to eat something, having, having an artificial intelligence help in that respect um, would directly affect me positively. Um, do you see other elements of that being useful? I see, Because I'm really cynical, right? So I see it as like, you have that sensor, right? But what if that sensor was designed by a pharmaceutical company that needs to sell more of their medicine, right? Because they make the medicine too. So what if they're, I don't know, I get like maybe too far in the weeds with this, but like maybe they're encouraging you to take more of the medicine so that you then have to buy more medicine. And and I, I don't know. I think it, it on the surface, it is very helpful. And the future of it is very optimistic and good because any advances in medicine are always a plus. But I also think that a lot of the pharmaceutical companies and companies in general do have their own, I hate the word agenda, but their own agenda. Right. And if they are able to make profit off these things there, I would not be surprised if there were some back doors that they would use to do that. And I think that's a valid concern. And I I, I think that's a real risk. So let's, now that you've turned all my goods into bads, (laughs) let me throw some bads out there and get your reaction. I'll turn them into goods. (laughs) Um, so one of the bad things that I see is that you're going to have fewer fewer jobs, but they're going to be more specialized, uh, and you're going to have an overall reduction of manufacturing jobs. Mm-hmm. Is yeah. that a valid concern? Yeah, I mean, we're already, we're already seeing that. Okay. Uh, how about insurance companies um, using AI to determine your validity of your claims based on data that the AIs are accumulating? You mean like like camera footage and yeah, camera footage, sensor footage from your car. 
You know, if, if they detect that your car was driving too fast when you got into an accident or that you didn't brake when you said you broke. I already have that in a way. Like, I know my mom, she used to have Progressive, and they put, like, a thing in your steering column that if you were a safe driver, I don't know how they calculated that, but I guess, like, your time to brake and speeding up and things like that, like, if you slam it's in your brakes. It's a random number generator. Yeah, it's a lottery. <laughs> but it would affect your rates. Um, right. So I think we're already seeing... I mean, it's not an AI. It's just like a ticker almost, I guess. But we're still seeing that data collection being used. How, how about the general loss of marketable skills as AI takes over more mundane jobs? I picture a future of Wally. We're all fat sitting in chairs and we can't even move around because AI is doing everything. Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe. But I think that there still will be people that service those bots I mean, until they learn to service until themselves. Until they learn how to service, yeah. I mean, yeah, you could just go down that rabbit hole, right, of like any job – that would require a human to fix an AI if that, that if that AI can then just invent that job with another AI, you, you know, you go further and further down the line. Sure. Uh, How about deep fakes? They're becoming a real issue nowadays. This stuff is scary. It's incredible how realistic it is. Do you think it's going to have an impact on 2020 elections? I think it already is. I think it did in 2016. Because especially, I mean, t we get Twitter and social media in general and how that's used to manipulate people, that's a whole other show. Yeah. But I think deepfakes specifically are, I mean, you see them on like, you know, whoa, look at this wacky deepfake of this funny character in a movie. But it's like, that looks so real. Yeah. And the implications of that are terrifying. I mean, I've seen uh, just people, internet personalities that have been not arrested or anything, but they've been, deepfakes have been made of them of explicit photos that they never took that were then released and yeah. taken as fact and that is extremely damaging to someone's life that they had nothing to do with that and this technology is it's very very hard to tell and it's only getting better yeah <laughs> you know unfortunately okay so we didn't turn any bads good so since we've gone f bad to worse <laughs> let's get to the uglies now. hey we always end this show in a flaming pile <laughs> of sadness so we might as well just keep going and that's the direction we're going today <laughs> So the first one that I have here is one that's a reality now to a certain extent. And that's automated military drones deciding when to use deadly force. <laughs> yeah. Skynet and the Terminator yeah. bots. What do you think that's a that's a real concern? Yeah, and I, I think we're already having those effects when the people that maybe the drones aren't entirely unmanned, but the people that man those drones, it's really damaging to their psyche because they become disassociated from that violence. Um, and the, there was a show, um, Jack Ryan, the second season yeah. of that, or the first season, one of the seasons of that show deals with a guy that used to operate these drones. And he, his, him and his team, it, they treat it like a video game almost. And then he, like, he has like a psychological break because of it. But yeah, so I think even having the humans deal with it now is already damaging to humans. But once that's entirely AI controlled, I don't know. I mean, I think it it could go both ways, right? Because AI, if they're given the ability to, might be able to better distinguish civilians from actual en enemy combatants. Um, but on the other hand, if they're never given those protocols, they might just, you know, it just removes the empathy at that point. That's true. Okay, well, that was... That was that a little, was, I gave you a little bit of a positive. You did. You, you and then kinda, I took it away because yep, I don't have any empathy. It ran out from under me. <laughs> um, so traditionally... Intelligence enables control. AI that's more intelligent than humans can institute control over humans. You think that's a that's a possibility? I mean, I think it's already happening on social media, right? I mean, we're entire Twitter movements <laughs> are being well. In all fairness, there's not a lot of human intelligence in social media. No, no, but we saw it with the 2016 election where bot accounts were able to manufacture uh, ideas that then swayed how voting was done. So I think in a way, AI is already controlling us. Not to mention, like I said before, the targeted advertisements, where if you pick up your phone and you scream Domino's at it for 30 seconds, you're going to get a Domino's ad. And I guarantee after the show, we're going to get one on our phone. So I think in, in subtle ways like that, when it comes to consumerism or political ideology, AI in a way is already, I mean, the AI is being controlled by you know companies or things like that. But I think it's already being used to sway and to, to herd, and maybe not control outright, but definitely to herd people into certain ideas. Okay, so I'll skip the question on manipulating the voting system. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so the last one that I had here is is probably the one that is the most apocryphal. 
Uh, this is the one that Stephen Hawking has yeah. spoken about when, when he was still alive. And that is super intelligent AI making humans obsolete, but not just making humans obsolete, realizing that they're obsolete and therefore a threat. Is that something that you think we have to fear? Um, I think so. Um, I don't know at what point in our history, but I think it, if you follow that line of thought, it definitely makes sense, right? If they, AI realized that, because I mean, even humans realize that we're, we're a negative force on basically everything on, on the, in terms of the planet that we consume, we don't really give back that much. We, in terms of input and output, our ratios are all wrong. And I think an AI would be able to see that pretty clinically. Um, and just make the easy decision that, you know, we're doing the planet in terms of sustainability a favor, <laughs> which, you know, it's not a great outlook, but I don't think, I don't know why they'd see it any other way unless they were able to program compassion <laughs> or mercy. I think you've got a valid point there. So the one question I do want to leave you with uh, and get your reaction on is as part of our human evolution, do you think that AI is a tool to lead us down that path? Or do you think it is at best a distraction or at worst a detriment to humanity? Um, I think it, it's definitely a tool um, that allows us to elevate what we're able to do through the use of technology, just like we would do with you know the invention of the hammer or the wheel. Um, the difference is that those things don't have brains, <laughs> right? So I think that as you follow the progression of how AI become more and more sophisticated, unless we put a cap on it and stop it, stop that intelligence from evolving too far, I do think you'll have a, even a, a, a philosophical crisis on your hands of what does it mean to be alive and what does it mean. And, and countless sci-fi movies and books and things have covered this before. But I think that if we allow it to go far enough, that's probably what we're going to end up with. And because we're already the dominant species, it'll probably will re will react negatively to another thing, you know, threatening us. Okay. And I, I wish I could disagree with you, but I, I, I think I'm along the same lines as you are. Yeah. So uh, since we're almost to the end of things, so we don't end in a burning pile of sadness, Um, a couple really great movies that deal and books that deal with this AI thing. There's I watched a movie recently called Ex Machina. Um, it's got Oscar Isaac and uh, Dom Hall Gleason. It deals with kind of like what I was just talking about, where like what does it mean to be human and things like that. That's on Netflix. Um, uh, Love, Death, and Robots. There's a th it's a bunch of short episodes, um, but some of them deal with that as well. Also, this book <laughs> I brought uh, for you, uh, Robo Apocalypse. Uh, it doesn't have the dust jacket, but yeah, that book is basically about it takes place after a robot war has happened. Humanity came out on top, but then it goes back in time and it finds like archival footage almost of how that came to be. And, and it gives a really realistic look at possibly in the near future, how something like this could happen. Um, so if those concepts interest you at all. I think those are definitely worth checking out. So there is fictional hope in the future for us. Oh, there's always fictional <laughs> hope. You can always bury your head in the book and ignore everything. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think that was that was all we had for today. Thank you for your time, Sam. Uh, we would invite anyone to uh, subscribe to our podcast. You can get us as uh, insights into tomorrow uh, for our audio podcast, our video podcast. You can look for insights into things on Apple Podcast, uh, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcast, etc. Uh, we do stream five days a week, six days a week on uh, Twitch at twitch.tv slash insights into things. Uh, and we would uh, welcome comments for or suggestions, questions, anything you have for us for the show. You can email us at comments at insights into things dot com. Anything else you want to finish with? No, I think we nailed it. All right. Yeah, we're. <laughs> I'm ready to jump out the window now. That's right. So, all right. Another successful podcast in the books. <laughs> Bye.